Oh, Father, we are humbled when we peer into your word and we read of your majesty. And we just ask you, Lord, that you would uh, grant us the ability to understand what your word teaches regarding your sovereignty and regarding our responsibility. And Lord, give us the ability to receive that which you have announced. And ultimately, Lord, through these things, in your grace, may you conform us to the image of your Son so that we might glorify your name, not of because of our own works, but because of what you work through us. We thank you so much for the cross and for the one who endured it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, as you recall last week, I outlined the biblical proclamation regarding the all-encompassing sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all things and all people. And we explored several texts to confirm that. And we could have gone into several more texts. We will be going through more texts that speak of God's sovereignty as we proceed through this class. But what we are going to do this week is take the next step. And if if you recall last week, my goal in this class is to deal with some of the macro issues first, the big issues, the all-encompassing sovereignty of God we explored last week. And this week, we are going to explore the next one on the totem pole, so to speak. That is the relationship between the sovereignty of God and the will of man. So if you are thinking of the gradient here as far as the macro issues, the macro issues we're dealing with in the first really two weeks, eh, three weeks. And then we're going to get into more specific issues such as prayer and evangelism and spiritual warfare, dealing with more centralized issues. So today we are getting into the rather difficult but important issue of the relationship between the sovereignty of God and the will of man. And I want to first, I want to start off with us going to the book of Acts. So if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 4, this is going to be how we are going to begin. And we are going to come full circle also as we uh, conclude we are going to arrive back in the book of Acts because Luke has a lot to say about the sovereignty of God and how it relates to the events that surrounded the crucifixion of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 4, this is when the gospel is first being proclaimed through the ministry of the apostles. And they are being persecuted, they are being arrested. And ultimately, in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, we have this proclamation. For truly in this city, that is Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So I want us to first think of what events Luke is chronicling here. The events were in this holy city. There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. There was a wide range of people who were gathered against your holy servant Jesus. Now the implication here, as we will see implications in other texts, that the ones who were gathered together against Jesus, Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, and the peoples of Israel, were doing evil. Gathering together against the Messiah is, I think it goes without saying, an act of great evil that comes forth from an unregenerate heart. But... Let's reflect here on what is said, because it's very radical and it has a lot to say about the relationship between the sovereignty of God and the human will. These evil men did whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So, 
Here is what's being said. God is sovereign. And I'll, I'll get into the why Luke is chronicling this when we return to Acts, because there's another very similar passage in Acts that I want to return to towards the end of the session. They were doing evil. God is sovereign, though. So even though they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, they were doing whatever your hand, God's hand, predestined to occur. So as we proceed here, and I'll I'll introduce this term early, but it's going to be a while until I really buckle down and, and explore it. This is compatibilism. And as we proceed here, you are going to see that this is not just uh, seen in Acts chapter 4. It's seen throughout the Bible. And I will further define compatibilism in a moment. What I want to do, and this is so important that we do this, is we need to explore the biblical testimony of the human will. We explored the sovereignty of God last week, that his sovereignty is all-encompassing. Now we need to take a look and, and ask, what does the Bible say regarding the human will? First, I want to note Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Now, in the context here, Deuteronomy is a sermon given by Moses to the people of Israel. And what is very interesting regarding this sermon is just prior to this, what we're going to read, Moses prophesied that Israel was going to go after false gods. And they were going to be disciplined for it. He also proceeds to tell of their restoration. But it was prophesied, even before this statement was made, that Israel was going to play the harlot. And then we come to Deuteronomy 30:19, And this is Moses. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Now the blessings and the curses are laid out in Deuteronomy. Blessings are there for them if they are faithful to the covenant of God. Curses will follow if they are unfaithful. This is very clearly outlined in Moses' sermon. Now they have that before you. And the call is to choose life in order that you may live. To choose life is a declaration, a call to trust and obey the God of the covenant and follow his commandments. Choose life. So the call went out, and it's an interesting call because it comes right after the Lord has declared, you are going to play the harlot. But he still calls out, choose life. So humans do make choices. Let's get this uh, out on the table. Humans make choices in the sense that they, they had life and death before them. And by and large, Israel made the choice of death. Curses. That is the, as we proceed through the, the reading of the Old Testament, we see this unfolding. The struggle between God and his covenant people. So, that's, but let's take that implication away from this. Humans do make choices. Okay? We'll, we'll define choice in a moment. Okay? But humans do make choices. Let's scoot forward. The biblical testimony of the human will number two. On the next slide. Humans are responsible moral agents. Moral, now I want to make sure I define my, moral doesn't mean they hold to a high morality. Like, oh, that, he's a really moral man, as sometimes our usage in modern English means moral is, is good. What I'm intending to convey here by using the word moral is that they have the capacity to know good from evil. Moral meaning they have the capacity to know good from evil. Humans are responsible moral agents. Let's highlight that term responsible. Now, I had a vast amount of scriptures I could have chosen to highlight here. 
Because anything that speaks of sin or God's wrath against sin highlights and implies that humans are responsible for their sin. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 1.6. I chose this one because it's quite powerful. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those who do not obey the gospel should have. They are accountable for not obeying the gospel. Therefore, God will righteously judge. He will deal out retribution to those who do not know him and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So, uh, whatever we say about the human will, it's true that humans are moral beings in the sense that they know, in general, the difference between right and wrong. I'm saying that generally. And also, that humans make choices. So that is, those are the two things. We, we see these implied throughout the texts. Now, the next one is extremely important. Because, and, and in fact, understanding this is the key to understanding the relationship between If you don't get the next one right, you're going to run into all sorts of problems, okay? Humans are in bondage to sin. Whatever we say about the human will, we have to acknowledge from the biblical evidence that humans are in bondage to sin. They are dead in sin. I'm going to highlight that next week in Ephesians chapter 2. But... Let's read Romans 3, verses 9 through 12. Now, in the context here, Paul has looked in Romans 1 and Romans 2 and declared that all Gentiles are under sin. Their conscience condemns them and creation condemns them. Because through these things, they see that there is a God. And then he says, what then? In Romans 3, verses 9 through 12, are we better than they? Speaking of Jews. Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. No, there is not even one. Now this flies in the face of how the world views humanity. Humanity, The world views humanity as what? Basically good. We're basically good people who make a few bad choices here and there, and there's maybe a couple bad seeds like Hitler. However, let's read and heed what the Scriptures say here. Number one, there's none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. And here, look at this. There is none who seeks for God. In our natural condition, there is none who pursues God because they are dead in sin. There is none who does good, not even one. Someone might say, well, what about the Boy Scout that helps the poor old lady across the street? But he doesn't believe. Isn't that good? Well, we need to remember how the Bible is defining good here. Good as defined by God. Now, what I would say is, at a horizontal level, we can look at acts from the outside and say, well, that was a charitable act. But God, being the heart knower, knows the intent behind every act. And there is none who can do Good in the sight of God, apart from His grace. And we'll get to that in the next few weeks. But here I want to focus in, and this is speaking of the the human condition, apart from God's grace. Okay, I want to make that clear. Apart from God's grace, this is the human condition. 
And, and Paul highlights this in Ephesians 2, and we'll get to that next week, because this also has a, uh, and the week after, this has a very um, strong correlation to understanding election and regeneration. Okay? So this is the doctrine of what some have called total depravity. I, I don't like the term because it makes it sound like humans are as bad as they could possibly be, and that's not true. I prefer that this is speak, uh, to, to define this as total inability. Humans are unable to seek after God, morally unable, because they are dead in sin, because they're not righteous, not even one. So there are no seekers. The only ones who seek are believers. Those are the seekers. Those are the true seekers. And we will get to that as we see. I hope you can start to see when we, when we say some of these things what type of impact they have on our practice in ministry. If we understand that only seekers are believers, what does that have to do with how we, for lack of a better term, do church? So think about that. We'll get into that more when we get into uh, the sovereignty of God and evangelism. So, just to recap here, I'm just trying to deal with this at a base level. The biblical testimony, and we're dealing with implications here, but these implications are not just here, they're throughout the whole Bible. Side by side. Humans, or God is sovereign, but humans make choices. Humans are responsible moral agents. They're responsible for the choices they make. And humans are in bondage to sin. From Adam on, everyone has been in bondage to sin save one. Jesus. Okay? So, we've laid down the understanding, at least pieces of of understanding, regarding the human will. Now what I want to do, before I get into defining free will, so to speak, I want to deal with the issue of foreknowledge. And I I want to sketch out some terms so you're familiar with them. They are really related to the the view of the human will and how it operates is how that is related to the foreknowledge of God. And those of you who who are familiar with theological debate over the last 15 years, this has been a very hot-button topic the foreknowledge of God. And let me sketch it out for you because it's very related to how we, what we understand regarding the human will. Classical Arminianism, and I'm going to define these terms in a moment, so don't freak out if you don't understand these terms, believes in what is called libertarian free will. And I'll define that in a moment. But they believe that humans are the ones that are self-determining agents and God foresees their choice and therefore, getting into next week a little bit, elects them on the basis of his foreknowledge. Calvinism, or Reformed theology, believes that God foreknows in light because he has foreordained all things. Therefore, he doesn't look through the corridors of time and see what humans have done and respond, or will do, and respond to that, Rather, he is the origin and source and the one who brings about salvation through election and predestination. Okay, I'll stop there for just a second. Here's, the, here's one of the big issues driving this, is what people in theology call a theodicy. And theodicy is... Uh, defending God or his nature, or giving reasons why, for instance, God is not the originator of evil, things like that. Defending God. So what Arminianism thinks they have, and here's the main question. Let me give you the, the main question. Number one, this is the number one question. Why would God create someone he knew was going to go to hell. And that is really the question that Arminianism thinks it solves by saying God looks through the corridors of time and elects them on the basis of what 
he sees, but he knows everybody else is not going to choose him. But what's the problem with that? Well, it, it really doesn't solve anything, does it? God still knows who, who is going to go to heaven and who is going to be condemned to hell in the Armenian scheme of foreknowledge, but he still proceeds to create these people and execute the judgment, does he not? So really, Calvinism and Arminianism, in their classical forms, have the same issue to deal with. And in comes open theism. They think they have the answer. Here's the answer that they propose. God does not have exhaustive foreknowledge. Why? Because since humans are free and they are self-determining, God cannot know what their will is going to do. Therefore, God cannot be held accountable, so to speak. I hate that word. I hate even saying it because we are the created. He is the creator. But this is what they say. So open theism thinks they have it solved by saying God doesn't know the, the exhaustive future. But what's the main problem with that? Well, it doesn't go with God's nature. And the reason why I think this is, is helpful to, to sketch out is I think they do a good job of showing the limitations of Arminianism. Because our, they, we would agree your Arminian doctrine doesn't solve anything. However, open theism is, is just so biblically bankrupt that it's really not too difficult to see that it is based in human philosophy rather than sound biblical exposition. It is overwhelmingly compelling that God knows the end from the beginning and that he knows the future and he knows what moral agents are going to do in the future. So, this has been a hot-button issue, and let's get down to the center of it. Here's the real issue, is how do you define free will? How do you define free will? Now, I want to recommend a really helpful article from somebody that's in this room. Um, Bob wrote an article a couple of years ago, this is the January-February edition of, of CIC, issue number 92, and it's called Free Will or the Bondage of the Will, with the subtitle of Definitions Are Critical. A lot of what I am going through, Bob, further uh, builds upon in this article, because I'm, I'm going to be drawing from Edwards, and, and that's a, a lot of what Bob interacts with in this in this article. So I would really recommend after tonight, if you want to brush up and, and read more on this, uh, read Bob's article because it's very well done. And he did a good job of wheeling it back, so to speak, so that it would be understandable for the layperson. Okay. That being said, this is really the, the, the crux of the issue. There are really two ways to look at, quote-unquote, free will. First is libertarian free will. And if you remember the slide that I just had up, both Arminianism and open theism would ascribe to libertarian free will. And I want to define that. Libertarian free will believes that the human will is free without constraint from human nature or divine predestination. I'll read that again. The will is free without constraint from human nature or divine predestination. Another real key phrase that is used by those, let's just use them in the bait, is does a person have the ability to do otherwise? For instance, with a lot of this stuff, I'm going to use real simple analogies just to not bog us down. Let's say I went out to eat at TGI Fridays down the road, and I sat down, and I chose to eat a steak. Now, upon thinking in that night, did I have the ability there to choose uh, fish? Looking back, okay, was that an actuality? 
So the libertarian would say yes, because you're, you're free from the constraints of your nature or divine predestination. So that wasn't an actual possibility. Now, and, and, and you know what, that's just, that's kind of our default position. We have the, I don't want to say the, well, it kind of is an, an illusion of this type of free will. We can do what it, you know, we, we have two choices, and certainly I, I, I could have chose that. But here's the issue. When we actually explore what is called compatibilistic free will, it forces us to step back and really see our world and the way our human nature works in a whole different paradigm. And granted, this isn't the type of stuff that you usually hear people talking about in the coffee houses. However, as we go through this course, we're going to see how important it is to really understand the place of the human will, to understand compatibilistic definition of free will, but also how important it is that we understand the sovereignty of God in light of this. What is compatibilistic free will? And it's the, the definition is very simple. The human will is free to choose what it wills, what it pleases, according to its nature and limitations. I'll say that again. The human will is free to choose what it pleases according to its nature and limitations. Okay, let me give you another analogy here. In this, um, let me state flat out, I don't like parades. You know, why, why are you saying that? <laughs> well, that's part of my nature. I kind of find parades to be a waste of time. So, <laughs> Bob says amen. <laughs> so, knowing, who, knowing my nature, and my wife knows that too, and if, if, if she knew someone was going to come up to me and say, do you guys want to go to parade, she knows that I would say no, because that is, I, she knows my nature. I don't like parades, I don't... Find, I find them to be a waste of time, so I don't want to go. That is part of my nature. So I'm choosing according to my nature. Now, let's put a, another slant on it. Let's say that I am going to be asked to go to a parade and my aunt and uncle are there that I haven't seen in three years. Well, I have a, I, I have a love for my aunt and uncle and that is a greater desire than avoiding a parade. <laughs> so, I choose in accordance with my desire. And as we step back and think about how we live our lives and the people we know, this, I mean, I acknowledge here that this is philosophical. But we, what we are doing in looking at this, and what Edwards was doing in looking at this, is trying to make sense of the biblical evidence that we have that God is sovereign and humans are accountable. Okay? And that's why we are digging in here because it's, it's an issue that many people have said, well, if, if you believe that God is sovereign, you can't believe that humans are free in any sense. You're just puppets. Has anybody ever heard that before? Yep. What exploring these things do is, number one, it, it, I think it looks at our world because I think Edwards, and again, I've talked about Edwards a lot without de declaring why I'm, I'm referring to him. Edwards penned a book, which is probably the most influential on this topic, and it's called The Freedom of the Will. It is extremely hard to read. Extremely hard to read. So that's why I recommended Bob's article first rather than that, because Bob kind of tries to take Edwards' thoughts and you know, in, encapsulate them in ways that we can further access, better access than reading Edwards' prose. So, compatibilistic free will is saying, yes, the, the human will is, is free to choose what it pleases. Okay, now let's back up. Now, as we looked at the biblical evidence, what pleases humans in their fallenness? <laughs> 
sin. So, humans are free to choose what they please. However, apart from God's grace, they will never choose Him. Remember what we read in Romans. No one seeks after God. So we choose according to our natures. And and here's why this really reflects what we read regarding the implications in Scripture. Let's look at God. I think it's a, it's a, a fair statement that since God is the most powerful and He does what He pleases, God is the most free being in the entire universe. He does whatever He pleases. However, God chooses and acts according to His nature, does He not? That is why we read in the Bible that God cannot lie. Because it's contrary to his nature. By his very nature, God cannot lie. So God chooses according, God acts, he wills according to his nature, which is holy. God will never do anything unrighteous. Do you see how this this view makes better sense than its inverse? And here's, let me further unpack it for you. Let's think of the human condition, the human state. In Adam, all died spiritually, right? So what what do their natures and their choices, humanity, in their fallen state, continually do? What are their choices? 100% of their choices are, in God's eyes, what? Sinful, evil. They're acting, they're choosing, but it's continually evil. Now, let's look at when God grants us and others regeneration. Now, what is our state like? Do we do good now that God has regenerated us? Sometimes, right? Do we do evil? Yes. So, in regeneration, we have, and this makes sense again when we look at what the Bible testifies, two natures. We have a new nature, and we have an old nature. One is fueled by the flesh, our fallenness. The other is fueled by the spirit. These are in, Galatians 5, these are in conflict. So you would not do the things that you please. So, uh, pre-regenerate uh, humans continually evil because their nature is evil. We are given a new nature at conversion, so we are able to choose good by God's grace. We also still choose evil. The Bible testifies of that. Now, let's look forward. When we are glorified, when God regenerates us completely, body, soul, and spirit, we will have no sin. We will again have one nature. But before we had one nature which was sinful, now we have the righteousness of Christ fueling us completely. Therefore, in, in heaven, we will only choose what is right. Because His grace is 100% fueling us. So, let's think of this. Now, if we were looking at it as uh, the libertarian free will, let's go back to that. If we look at the will as the actual ability to always choose between two options, good and evil. If you hold to the view that those in heaven cannot fall then you would have to say that we don't have free will anymore in heaven. Right? Does everybody follow me there? If you don't, shake your head. Because God has promised that he has secured us forever. And 
in heaven, we, the option isn't there to choose evil because God is fueling us completely. However, when we look in, in, in this manner, in compatibilistic free will, well, it makes perfect sense. God's given us a new nature, completely, body, soul, and spirit, and we are fueled by his Holy Spirit. Therefore, we will never sin because his grace is fueling us. So, again, I want to make this clear, that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, we are dealing with implications from Scripture. We are trying to make sense of the implications. There isn't a text in the Bible that is devoted to explaining how the human will works. We can't do exposition on that. So what we are dealing with is implications. I wanted to give you a a wonderful, I, I think, clear definition of compatibilism. Now, this is another person I highly recommend. His name is D.A. Carson. He's probably the person, as far as modern theological writers, that has influenced me the most regarding understanding compatibilism and its, its biblical roots. Here is his definition, which I think is, is, is fantastic. The Bible as a whole, and sometimes in specific text presupposes or teaches that both of the following propositions are true. One, God is absolutely sovereign, but his sovereignty never functions in a way that human responsibility is curtailed, minimized, or mitigated. So that's the first one. And that's, as we go through the Bible, you'll see that. that it's, it's assumed to be true. Number two, human beings are morally responsible creatures. They significantly choose, rebel, obey, believe, defy, make decisions, and so forth. And they are rightly held accountable for such actions. But this characteristic never functions so as to make God absolutely contingent. Meaning God depending on the created thing. That is compatibilism in a nutshell. Now, he, he says the Bible as a whole and sometimes in specific texts. Let's look at another specific text. As I said, we were going to come full circle back to Acts. Now, this is Acts 22 and 23. Acts 2, 22 and 23. This is Peter. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The the Acts chapter 4 verse and the Acts chapter 2 verse are very similar, are they not? Both declare that humans were doing evil, but they were doing what God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge had predestined. Now, notice here. First, let me say, why is Luke chronicling this this way? Why does he highlight these things? Well, I think one of the main reasons is to announce, and obviously Peter declared this also, and the intent is is similar, is to declare that the crucifixion of Jesus was not an accident or something that God did not anticipate. Rather, this is the plan of God from all the ages. It's not that God's plans were being frustrated by his Messiah being killed. Rather, this was planned before the beginning of the world. And why is this significant? I want to read another piece of Carson. Because... Let's note this. This is surrounding the greatest event of salvation history, the cross. And compatibilism is being declared here in both these texts. God is sovereign over all these things. But men, the men who did it, are responsible. Godless men and put them to death. They were opposed to Jesus. I want to read what Carson declares here because he, he notes this regarding the, the time of the cross and all these things that went into it. It, takes, it only takes a moment's reflection to show that if this is Carson here, this is on 212 of How Long, O Lord? 
It only takes a moment's reflection to show that if the Christian gospel is true, this tension could not have been otherwise. Speaking of the tension of God's is sovereign and, 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 and men are responsible. If the initiative had been entirely with the conspirators and God simply came in at the last minute to wrest triumph from the jaws of impending defeat, then the cross was not his plan, his purpose, the very reason why he had sent his son into the world, and that is unthinkable. If, on the other hand, God were so orchestrating events that all human agents were non-responsible puppets, then it is foolishness to talk of conspiracy or even of sin in which there is no sin for Christ to remove by his death. So why should he have to die? God was sovereignly at work in the death of Jesus. Human beings were evil in putting Jesus to death, even as they accomplished the Father's will, and God himself was entirely good. Christians who deny compatibilism on, the, on front after front become compatibilists, knowingly or otherwise, when they think about the cross. There is no alternative except to deny the faith. And if we are prepared to be compatibilists when we think about the cross, that is to accept both of the prepositions that I set out at the head of this chapter as true, as they are applied to the cross, it is only a very small step to understand that compatibilism is taught or presupposed everywhere in the Bible. I think that is, those are powerful words. And that's why I wanted to, hi, to really focus on the Acts passages. Because it really demonstrates God's sovereignty. Because if we say God is not sovereign here, but the, the humans just did what they want and God snuck in at the last minutes, as he says, to, to wrestle defeat from the jaws, or victory from the jaws of defeat, then it wasn't his, his plan and purpose to send him into the world to deal with sin. And if, if there's no responsibility and they're just puppets, then why send Jesus to die if there is no sin? So these things are presupposed. And if you deny them, you deny the gospel. Because you're going to deny sin, and you're going to deny the purpose of God sending his son into the world. So this is compatibilism. And we can get a little bit into this as we, as we, as we get into the discussion portion. But I know these, these are rather big concepts, and I hope I did an adequate job of at least uh, explaining the categories to you. But remember Carson again said in specific texts, cat, uh, compatibilism is often declared. And the assignment I gave to you this last week is evidence, again, of that. And Genesis 50, 19 through 21, remember I told you to reflect on the life of Joseph. And if you recall, his brothers, who were ticked off with him, faked his death and sold him into slavery. And this is Joseph's response to them. This is after Joseph had ascended to power in Egypt and his brothers were now trembling before him. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I, am I in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now, Joseph had fantastic theology here. He understood God's providence. But let's note this. As for you, you meant it against me. Let's look at their natures. They meant that act. They chose according to their desires and worked evil against Joseph. So there's an intent, and there was an intent of evil. On their part, God, in that same event, meant it for good. He's working according, in accordance with his nature, the good Lord who rules over all. And there's also a lot, we're going to probably return to this text in, when we look at the issue of suffering. Um, but I've gone a little over my time, so we will stop there and we will open it up. I'm sure there's a lot of good areas of discussion we can hit on tonight. Before we get into discussion, I want to give you next week's assignment. Next week, we are moving on to the issue of election. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to offer this class is not just 
that you would understand the issues regarding the sovereignty of God, but that you would be able to defend the doctrines of grace. And the way we do that is through proclaiming the Word of God. And a biggie, a huge text regarding the sovereignty of God, regarding election, and regarding the sovereignty of God and salvation is Romans chapters 9 through 11. Infamous. Read Romans 9 through 11. Now, here's what I want you to ask. Ask, why is Paul explaining, explaining these things? And I'll give you a hint. Concentrate on his flow of argument. Read chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. And that's, that's really the clue as to why Paul is explaining all that he does in Romans 9 through 11. Okay? Next, what do the objectors' questions or objections tell us about Paul's teaching on election in chapter 9? There's an objector in, in, in chapter 9, a, a mock objector that Paul brings up. And ask yourself, what does this objection tell us about what Paul is teaching on election? Just ask those questions and see what, see what answers you come up with. So next week, what we're going to do next week is we're going to, it's going to be a departure from, this week was different because we need, I wanted to deal with some philosophical issues and I wanted to define compatibilism because as we proceed throughout the rest of the course, you will see this over and over again. God is sovereign, but we are responsible and we are called to act. That is going to be a theme that we see throughout every session of this class. So next week is going to be very expositional, if that's even a word. We're going to be doing a lot of biblical exposition. We're going to get into mainly Romans 9 through 11 and Ephesians chapters 1 and 2 next week. So that is next week. Now let's open the floodgates. Questions, comments? Thank you. I have one question on your slide where you talked about the biblical testimony of the human will, number three. Yep. You went into our natural position and our totally inability ability to see God. You made the statement, good defined by God, but you never completed it. Okay. What is good defined good by God? Good defined by God is his righteous standard. Holy according to his righteous standard. Wouldn't you agree that that's the view of, of good? Well, good and, would be everything that's in uh, accord with God's own well, nature. Exactly. And his own moral will and moral law. Yep. Law. And there's no one who does that. So when we, a lot of times, you know, and that's why I wanted to make the distinction is we call things on the outside, on a horizontal level, yeah. good. Because we can say, well, that act, helping someone, giving, giving a hungry person uh, a meal, we would not say, well, that's an evil act. But the intent behind it, we don't see. I'm doing this because, boy, I look good in front of the cameras. Uh, well, now, we'd also would say this. That when you compare one human to another human, there are differences between humans doing good in a human capacity, not in a way that merits righteousness before God. Right. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the judicial righteousness that's required in God's court of law. That's a whole different standard. But we would certainly want to say that according to common grace, yeah, there are the people word. that there's, there's, there is a... Um, objective difference between Mother Teresa and Hitler, even if they're both lost. Right. And that's a very important, Bob keyed in on a term that's very important, common grace. Do you want me to define that? Okay. <laughs> common grace is the grace that God gives all. A text that's often given is God sends rain on the just and the unjust. Right. And... God gives common grace to every single individual. Here, let's think of this. The fact that you are, that any human on earth right now is breathing and not in a state of pain under punishment because of their sin is God's common grace. So common meaning in and around all.
So if, say, Bob gives the Mother Teresa and the Hitler example, Mother Teresa has not earned anything. The state that she is in and what she had done, if there's anything horizontally good, as we would see on a human level, that's we thank God for that also. Yeah, human, humanly, it's praiseworthy to be benevolent, and we acknowledge that. And it's blameworthy and to do evil in the sense that you're going to be brought before the judge. Right. In fact, law, civil law, is part of common grace. Yep, it's part Romans of how, 13. Yes, how God helps restrain evil so that even evildoers are in a better state because you're not in utter chaos and anarchy. It's part of common grace. But saving grace only comes through the gospel. Mm-hmm. It only comes through what God has done for us in Christ. And the only way we can be righteous before God's holiness and his utter perfect righteous standard is have the imputed righteousness of Christ, not our own good works. So the distinction, the theological distinction, these are theological words, would be common grace is that which is given to all. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And saving grace is that which he gives to his children, the elect, which we'll talk about next week. Okay, um, when you were... Defining free will, difference between libertarian and compatibilistic free will, you talked about currently we have two natures, mm-hmm. flesh and spirit, and when we get to heaven we'll have the one nature, and we will be unable to choose anything but good. So how do we explain Lucifer and the fallen angels? Good question. That's, yeah. that's a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> Next week. Am I going to fellowship time? Do I have to get stickers that say a stoop? <laughs> yeah. And then, then they can put them on their chest? Astute, astute reading or astute question. Or can I answer yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. That is the objection. That is the one thing that if you find people who believe in the libertarian free will, they'll always go back to Adam. And I had a debate with a guy one time, a somewhat formal debate, and that's exactly where he went. Uh, let's just take Adam, for example. Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? They, didn't, they weren't created with an evil nature. They were created by God. So how did these beings, or how did Adam and Eve ever choose evil for the first time that they chose evil? And, and the, the only answers we can have to some of these questions are implications for what we know the Scripture does say. Yep. Okay? So the implication for what the Scripture does say is that Adam and Eve were created innocent and without sin, but not incorruptibly so. Okay? They were innocent, but not perfect in the ultimate sense yep. of perfection. So they were innocent, but not incorruptible, and sure enough, they became corrupted. And the same thing with Lucifer. The same, and the same thing goes with all other moral agents that ever rebelled. Now, why does it say that, what about the two-thirds, let's, let's assume, for example, that the one-third, two-third is correct. There's reason to assume that. Let's say the two-thirds of the angels that never rebelled, what about them? How is it that they didn't rebel, even though at one point they had the same nature as the ones who did? Well, the answer is that God gave them grace so that they would not, because they're called the elect angels. angels. Yep. Okay? So God elected to preserve two-thirds of the angels from this by giving them grace to not do so. Otherwise, why are they called elect angels? And where is that, 1 Peter? Or? It's either that or Jude. I can't. Well, somebody with, a computer, somebody with a computer Bible can find yep. that. Chosen angels, elect angels, or what have you. So then the other question, as long as we're talking about this, he said, well, if God had the ability, and this one I've heard people who, there are, there are people that hate the doctrines that Ryan and I are teaching so much so they rail at, against it. And some of the books I've read, I'd say, are borderline blasphemy. These, these people are so angry to, at the thought that God would choose anybody that they'd rather blaspheme the idea than to submit to what the Scripture says. And... I read a book that somebody handed me about that, that was doing that, just recently. And I finally, I, the guy that gave it to me, I said, this guy is a blasphemer. No. 
And they're saying, what kind of God would have the ability to keep these things from happening and not do it? Well, it's the same thing the atheists say. Yeah. So what these people are saying is that if God has the ability to give grace to two-thirds of the angels so that they don't fall, then he has grace to give uh, uh, ability to give grace to 100% of the angels so they don't fall. But he didn't do so. So obviously he doesn't have the ability, otherwise he's an evil God. That's what they're saying. That's what the atheists say. And I'm saying, Romans 9, who are you, no. O oh man, to reply to God and to say, why have you made me like this? Oh, I gave it away now. He gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, the, there, there's, a, there's this lack of humility. Uh, I saw this, this other guy that, that I know and, and contended with about this was, was saying, if there is such a thing as this sort of grace that you're talking about, why didn't God just give it to Adam and Eve right there in the garden and we wouldn't have this mess? And you know what? And here's another thing, and I know... So, so what was the answer? Well, God can run his universe how he sees fit. Who are you? Yep. And exactly why? The Bible doesn't specifically tell us. No, we don't know. Why. We don't know. And this is where we, you know, again, this is coming back to what I mentioned last week in the beginning tonight. Where the Bible is silent, we need to submit to, yeah. submit to its teaching. And if there is mystery, we... We have to confess the Lord is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he will do that which is right. Absolutely. We have to confess that. And here's another grieving example. And this is, you can comment on this, but this stuck with me when Bob told me about this. There was a guy, he's written a lot of books, and he's actually, well, not a lot of books, but a few books. He's local here. And this is back when you were going to the pastor's meeting. And he said, if God elects some and not others, I will not serve him. Oh, yeah. I've heard that more than once. And you know where that guy ended up in? Open theism. Open theism. Because he was a fairly smart guy, and he realized that Arminianism really solves no problems. But think of that. Just think of that statement and how it's so grieving. It's, he's saying, I am going to serve God on my terms. Yeah, not on his. Yeah, it's a very hard-hearted thing to say. And, and I would never say that. God can run his universe how he sees fit. And that's, that's, that's going to be a big part of next week. Okay, we have one, two, three. Patient. We're going to get a lot of stickers for next week. Patient, astute. <laughs> okay, I have a question about um, Genesis 50. Yes. 50, we were talking about um, the brothers intended evil for Joseph, but God meant it for good. And that just made me think of the question... Um, does the intent of the act make the act evil, or is it the act itself evil? Um, both, uh, I think. Well, I think that the nature, again, they're choosing. In ethics, it's a good question. Go ahead. But intent is an issue in ethics, okay? And it's even just comparing human actions to other human actions. Let's say a guy takes a knife and intends to rob somebody and runs the knife through the guy's heart and he dies. All right? Mm -hmm. Let's say another guy is a heart surgeon, and in the midst of taking the knife and working to save the, the, the guy's life, he dies on the operating table. Oh. Well, we would say intent. the intent is very important because in one sense it's absolutely wicked intent and uh, be worthy of capital punishment if we only had it in this state. Yep. And then the, the other one, <laughs> the other one, is the intent is to save a life, and the outcome turned out to be different. Yep. But now, when it comes to our standing before a perfectly holy, righteous God who demands sinless perfection as the standard, then we have to say the intents of our heart are only evil, mm -hmm. as it says here. So because that, because maybe the even the heart surgeon, if you look at a bigger scheme, if he's not a Christian, he, he's not giving glory to God. Yeah. He, whatever's without a faith is sin. And uh, the, so intent, in, the intent, in, in, intent and the act itself can be both be act, evil. Yeah, the, it, so the intent and the act can be evil. The act can be good compared to human standards of good compared to evil, yeah. trying to save life. But if you're lost... Your intent never measures up to, to God's righteous standards. standards. 
That's kind of what I was getting at, but I was trying to kind of figure out the compatible side of it where, you know, God meant it for good, yep. but it was an evil act. Right. So therefore, is it the well, God, act that's evil or God is it or the intent that was evil? That was the, evil well, again, the we, there's a primary cause and a secondary cause. Exactly. And the so the secondary cause is, you know, the brothers were evil, but God is still sovereignly bringing about that event through permitting this, knowingly allowing this to happen for a reason, for a purpose. Therefore, God's intent, will they, will they be judged? Yes. I mean, yeah, in the scheme of things, evil will be judged. Yeah. Yep. Um, the, the one thing you brought up today that, uh, that I liked was that uh, you were talking about different natures and that we have an old nature and a new nature. We will have a glorified nature where we will be able to uh, obey God perfectly. And uh, I, I think if, you know, Jesus talked about being born again, uh, born of the Spirit, mm-hmm. and that we are new beings, so... Uh, there's this idea of of this change or this rebirth or this re, uh, regeneration, create a new creation, mm-hmm. and um, I, th- I think you have to have that in mind uh, before you can, you know, uh, when you're at least when you're contemplating God's sovereignty, because you know at, at the stage we're in now in this life. We can't please God perfectly, mm-hmm. but he's made provision for that, and we can look forward to that. Yeah, I agree, and that's why the, the, the practical implications of this are, are enormous. You know, you can see, I mean, this isn't just, you know, academic language here that we're throwing about to look fancy. This is r- tied to our eternal salvation. So, uh, understanding that we are given this new nature and it is fueled by we're born of the spirit therefore we're for lack of a better word again fueled by the holy spirit we're looking forward to the day when we are consumed by the spirit in in, in the power of the spirit i had a comment i guess about the will i mean the biggest difference you can see between libertarian and compatibilistic is obviously is the will like how fallen is the will in a sense right like and how would you best explain to someone that their will is by nature almost in bondage, yet it's, it's, it wants to do the sin, it wants right. to please, it, please the sinful nature? Right. Well, this kind of gets back to the purpose of the doctrines of grace and how we preach them. I think, you know, we can, bringing out fancy philosophical language may not be the best thing, but rather bringing out the Word of God, saying this is God's testimony regarding this. He's the one that sees the human heart and knows its condition better than we do. Yeah. Better than man and does. This is it's all altogether evil and it's the altogether evil. Is... So I, I think using the testimony of the word yeah. there is the best answer. Because the word of God is powerful and quick yeah. and you know and that's the we'll get to this in, the, in when we get into evangelism. But the, the, these concepts are freeing when we get into understanding our task of evangelism because it's not our ingenuity that saves people because we know the only thing that can give life to a dead sinner is the grace of god amen that comes through the gospel it comes through the, the gospel, gospel. Yep. And you know what i do have many questions but it happened that this morning my reading was referencing the apostle paul in his last epistle, who wrote about certain philosophers who would be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in the next verse, he makes it clear that such people, no matter how scholarly or well-educated, they seem to be and are still incapable of accepting real truth. So these resist the truth. They could not learn the truth because they were not willing to believe or obey the truth when they learned it. And they end up, he ended up saying it's a basic unwillingness to believe doctrines plainly revealed in God's word when they conflict with doctrines based solely on human reasoning. And I don't understand it. But 
I'm more afraid of having a spirit of unwillingness. Yeah. Yeah, I... God bless you. That's a... That's, that's a fantastic attitude. It's, it's, that's what we want. That's the attitude we have. I mean, we need to have as we go under the word. Uh, I, we all need to confess we're finite humans. And you think, think of the, the, the knowledge that is in the universe. I mean, the most brilliant Ph.D. that has the most head knowledge is, is just a, a speck in the, in the desert of sand of knowledge. I mean, just think of the universe, how much is out there. We, have, we know so little, and we think we know so much. We know so little, and we need, and that's why I think when we reflect on the sovereignty of God and on His majesty, remember when, when, when people come into the, the holiness of God in the Bible, they're not asking Him, well, why do you do this, or why did you do this, or why did you do this? They're falling on their faces <laughs> and saying, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So my prayer is that we all would echo that, that we recognize our place. We, we were wretched sinners and God saved us. And he runs his universe as he sees fit. And even when we get into eternity, we're probably not going to have all the answers. We don't become all-knowing when we are redeemed. But uh, we'll know more. But again, our calling is to be Humble. And here's the only way we can be humble. By His sovereign grace. By Him changing our hearts. Because we're by nature prideful. Nick. Um, as we're talking about compatibilism and uh, Joseph and his brothers, wouldn't also the example of Job be a, an example of that where Satan comes to ask to sift Job, uh, to tempt Job, and mm-hmm. to Jesus. And, and his, uh, what Satan wanted to do was clearly evil. But God allowed it, so God was in agreement to allow Satan to do what he willed. But God, Satan wanted to do it so that uh, Job would be shown to be someone who wasn't faithful. Yep. God allowed it to prove that Job was faithful and also to bring glory to himself. So Amen. in that we see one action, one course of action, and two very different motives. Exactly. Another sticker for Nick, because yep. that's exactly yeah. what, is, what we're going to be going over when it comes to spiritual warfare and the sovereignty of God. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the lights are going on in regards to how this affects our practice in all sorts of areas. You think of spiritual warfare and think of false practices of spiritual warfare and how they would be corrected if they just came to an understanding and belief in the all-encompassing sovereignty of God. It, 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 the sovereign, understanding the sovereignty of God, compatibilism, because... Um, I don't want to, God, you know, demands things from us. And the only way we can meet them is by his grace. And th- that's another thing. That we are going to marvel at his majesty and his sovereignty. But we also need to read the scriptures and by his grace heed what he commands of us. So sovereignty, uh, we'll get into this when we get into sanctification, isn't something that just causes us to say, well, he's sovereign, so I'm just going to. Sit back and do what I will. No, we should be. The grace of God is, is activating. By God's grace, we are excited to go forth with the gospel of grace and announce it because that's what our king wants. I want to talk about seeking God. Yes. This was my question as I listened to the lecture. And I remember having a debate with someone. The question was this. What about the passages that describe people seeking God? One time I was debating a famous author by sending letters back and forth. And he he said this to me, because I was warning him that he was treading in very serious territory by his claim that if God doesn't do everything he possibly can to save everybody, then God's not a loving God. Right. Now, which is a human philosophy he's imposing on the Bible, not a biblical statement. So I said to him, just read Romans 3. It says, none seek after God. What else do you need to know? And he came back and said, well, you've got to balance that with the verses that say certain people did seek God. And I wrote back and I said, you can't balance none seek after God with some seek after God. <laughs> that's a contradiction. Okay? And, if the, and if that's the way it is, if the Bible actually does say none seek after God, 
and some seek after God in the same sense, and you know what I mean, the mm -hmm. A is not non A. Yep. Then you have a contradiction in the Bible as a lie, and the Bible is in error. Now, his theology gives him no solution, so he has to say just balance the two. My answer is this. None seek after God until after God's done a work of prior work of grace, and then after he does a work of grace, a lot of people seek after God. Exactly. So whenever you see somebody in the Bible seeking God, then you know God done, did a work of grace. And you know what? If we look at Romans, <laughs> if we look at Romans, that's Paul's flow. In 1, one 2, and 3, Paul is making the declaration that all are under sin. And as we proceed, we, start to, we read of those who are freed from slavery to sin. So that's Paul's intent, is to bring us to see that before regeneration, right. before the work of the cross, humans are bound in sin. But in the work of Christ and faith in his finished work, we are freed from sin. And it's all by his grace. And that's really what Romans 9 through 11 is, is about. <laughs> Don't um, forget while you're doing the assignment to take a look at Romans 10 in the middle of Romans 9 and 11. Mm -hmm. And see what the implications you see. Uh, that's been really uh, uh, something special. I'll, I'll mention something next week during the discussion about what I see in Romans 10. But I've been seeing that as advice to give people. Uh, lately, people have been emailing me or calling me about hopeless situations. And what they're saying is, well, I have a daughter who's so rebellious against God that she's done every sort of evil. And she, won't, she forbids me to say one word to her about God. What do I do? And such things. Yeah. So next week, remind me during the discussion time to show, maybe you'll find it for yourself. There's an answer to that question in Romans 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. Okay? But see in your reading what that answer is. So and you, I'm adding to your, sorry to add to your slide. <laughs> yeah, here. Well, whatever. It's good stuff. Good stuff all around. My prayer, again, for this class is that your worldviews would get revolutionized, not by philosophy, but by learning, becoming accustomed with the word of truth. And when we start to understand God's sovereignty in all things, I think we truly start to understand what grace really means. It's not something we've earned. It's something 100% a work of our triune God. So dig into Romans 9 through 11, and I really look forward to next week. So.